This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. A much told story, I'm afraid, this one <laughs> has exasperated <laughs> many people. <laughs> Almost the entire Oriental Studies faculty at Oxford is fed up with this story. <laughs> well, it's really, really envious because I worked on the same source and we only had a microfilm uh, reproduction of that and it was really very cumbersome to go through all the microfilms. And, it, and it, we very much emphasise how important it is to actually see the real thing before you and be able to actually... Um, uh, kind of go from one page to the next and see the whole thing, which in theory you can do with a microfilm, but in practice you actually only see the, the, the part of on these big newspaper pages. So, so that's how I knew her kind of for the work on, um, uh, not so much on the newspaper actually, but um, uh, on, uh, on the early Republic, um, very important in her two books on the making of the Republic and citizens, and then a really wonderful book that is very popular with students, and I think is really very kind of engaging for students is, is the book you wrote about uh, Leo, sorry, Leo Daopang. Leo Daopang, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, a, um, a local scholar who made it to the second degree of examinations who lived in a small village in Shanxi and left an incredible diary that, that covered a period, I think, from the 1870s, 80s until the 19, early 1940s. And, and basically, I'm going to use this diary to, to write what we could say an intellectual, cultural, social history mm-hmm. of that period, which is um, a, not a very thick book, a very kind of um, kind of small book actually in some ways, but but incredibly um, engaging and rewarding. What was the name mm-hmm. to read? Uh, the man awakened from the man awakened from awakened dreams. From dreams. <laughs> Um, anyway, I, I guess one could say much more. She's been in Harvard for a couple of years, right? Seven years. Seven oh, years. <laughs> <laughs> Longer than you think. Yes, shorter than I've been in Sela, so. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, mm. uh, has been back, um, back a to couple of years. Back to Oxford, you said, for one, and one, year, half year, one, one and a half years. One and a half years yeah. now. And um, we are very kind of curious to see what, what you will tell us now. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand up so I can see over the top of everybody's heads. Um, uh, this is really different from ev- <laughs> the Catholics. Exactly. This is really different from anything I've done before. It's an. It's. A, I've been working on Shanxi local history. This does have a Shanxi local history connection, but that's not what you're going to get today. Um, one of the joys of um, switching from uh, Shanxi local history to uh, the McCartney Embassy is that you're in a world where people are, you're looking at things that people have studied about. I feel like an anthropologist who suddenly found themselves studying Indonesia. <laughs> you know, all the big arguments in the field are made about the McCartney Embassy. Loads of big things have been said about it in a way that simply isn't true for um, uh, rural Shanxi. So instead of having to make up arguments, you actually find yourself engaging with other people's arguments. And actually, my main target at the moment for my research is this very famous quote. You've probably all seen this quote. It's in every English high school history textbook um, for, for, for Chinese history. If you get Chinese history, you get this quote from the Qianlong Emperor where he says, strange and costly objects do not interest me. I said, and at the end, I, I'm sorry the print is very small, but you will, this, will, this quote will be familiar to you. I set no value on objects strange or ingenious, and I have no use for your country's manufactures. Um, and this is the Qianlong's part of, well, the far the most famous part of the Qianlong Emperor's um, letter to the English king. And because of the widespread familiarity with this quote, all kinds of popular writers textbook writers, but also people writing about, you know, Chinese business and all sorts of people 
um, interpret the McCartney embassy and particularly the Chinese response to the gifts sent by the British as a foolish and blinkered rejection of international trade, the Industrial Revolution, even the modern world in general. Um, and in fact, the major study of the gifts bought, bought by the embassy defines its topic as scientific apparatus and is titled A Case Study in Cultural Collision. Okay, and this is really the mode through which the um, embassy's gifts have been viewed. And behind this interpretation of the embassy lies John K. Fairbanks' very powerful model of the reasons for 19th century China's weakness facing the Western powers. And he makes a contrast between the Chinese tribute system, uh, in which China sees itself as the centre of the world, and the Western idea of equal nation states. This will be familiar to anyone who's ever read a textbook account of 19th century Chinese history. All the textbooks we have are based on this, on this no novel, on this model. And he uses this idea of the Chinese tribute system to argue that China's failure to successfully resist the Western powers was due to an ideology, the ideology of Sinocentrism, um, and in which they couldn't deal with the British because the British were unwilling to conform to the rituals of the tribute system because they be belonged to a world of equal nation states and wanted to have that mode of view. Now, the idea that the tribute system was the dominant mode of China's foreign relations in the 18th and 19th century has subsequently been heavily criticised by all those people we know as the New Qing history, who work on Manchu sources and who emphasise that the Qing was a conquest dynasty. Um, all this will be very familiar to all of you, and that James Hevier obviously used those ideas in his book on the McCartney Embassy. On the British side of the exchange, um, Western diplomatic historians have also reminded us that the late 18th century is a moment of great change in Western diplomatic history. Um, and that before this time, Europe was not a world of equal nation states. Um, that's a fallacy of Chinese historians. I don't think Western diplomatic historians ever thought that, the world, that Europe was a world of equal diplomatic states. Um, the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire are at the top of the ladder and other nations go downwards, kings come next and then you know you get right down to the Dutch Republic which as a republic is the lowliest of, of the European states. Um, and Christian Wind Windler, actually probably that's not how he pronounces it, he's a German, um, has recently argued that this kind of idea of a hierarchical system made it much easier for European powers to deal with the Ottoman Empire. Because, all, because there you have a sense of there being plural, multiple different kinds of normative systems and that the, that the European powers can accept this in this period. The, these people argue that the new world of equal, the ideal of equal nation states arose in the 18th century out of Enlightenment rationalism and the practical consequences of the French Revolution, which that France, a very powerful country, then became a republic and clearly was not going to be treated at the bottom of the hierarchy of states. Obviously, the idea of a world of equal nation states, just like the tribute system, is an ideal. There is not and never has been a world of equal nation states any more than there ever has been a world in which China was the centre of everywhere. And everybody really knows this fact. Um, and what this, I think, if we take the two, the changing history of China, of, of, of the changing ideas about the Manchus and China and the changing ideas of Western diplomatic history, it suggests at the basic level that we need to look, move away from quite essentialised models of the relationship between culture and international relations. Obviously, systems of international relations change and develop through time. Um, and the practice of diplomacy, how you actually do diplomacy, is one of the ways in which such change occurs. And if we look at the McCartney embassy in this way, it, comes, it, it looks quite different. Um, by describing China's foreign relations as a tribute system, Fairbank and the people who followed Fairbank put all their emphasis on, put a lot of emphasis on the, on the Chinese idea that the British gifts were tribute, which is the idea that comes across in this famous paragraph. <coughs> 
Um, on the other hand, they don't, people haven't paid any attention at all to the gifts the Chinese gave the British, which are basically unstudied. Um, this paper <coughs> argues that the gifts, given, the gifts given by both sides, not just the British side, were central to the embassy. They were expensive, spectacular, designed to demonstrate the giver's wealth and power. As material objects, they were also open to multiple interpretations. And because their interpretation of them is always ambiguous because they're things, not words, um, that's something that enables you to move towards an agreement in a situation when you actually have very competing interests in the way that diplomats need to. Um, and finally, I also argue that because of the very limited opportunities in this embassy for verbal translation, the market value of goods as objects of global trade is crucial to this process. Um, whereas the use of objects to represent the state's ideology or philosophy basically doesn't work, it's a failure. But where, where, where objects, where you can tell what the object's value is, it works. So I want to start with the splendour of the gifts. This, these were a very spectacular set of gifts on both sides. Obviously the British were the, um, they initiated the embassy and they sent the first set of gifts. These are sent to China. These are the, this is the value of the most, these are the gifts. So these are the British gifts um, it, and they are with the total value. So this, this is not the order the British gifts are normally presented in in our texts. This is, if you, but you can add up because the sums of, they were bought for are available. You can see that the most valuable gift that the, gift the British gave were textiles, woolen broadcloths, okay? Um, the second most valuable gift were some, a pair of carriages for the emperor. Then there's a planetarium, we'll come back to the carriages in the planetarium later, some globes, chandeliers, guns and pistols, a gold box decorated with diamonds, and then these three objects for which I don't have a precise price, but they, but they were very expensive. They were bought later and the, I haven't yet found the price. A, 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 a mo very modern new telescope and a huge glass lens, um, and then six small cannon and two mortars, which were presumably quite expensive too. Um, after the um, embassy arrived in China, the, um, so this is, these are some of the kind of types of objects that, that are being presented, because I don't think we always think about that. We tend to think of nothing but scientific instruments. So uh, this is just to give you a little idea of, um, this is a mechanical chair, porcelain, um, uh, no, biscuit, what do they call it? Well, what is it? It's a kind of stoneware. A kind of stoneware. Thank you. Um, this is Jasperware too. <laughs> yes. Um, this is the this is the order of the gifts that we normally see. So when the when they when the British got to China, the Chinese asked for a list of gifts to the emperor. Not all the gifts were gifts to the emperor. Um, and the British wrote a list, and they wrote it in this order. And actually, you see the cloth comes right at the bottom. British manufacturers, including cloth, on this version of of the list. Um, uh, but the planetarium is, which obviously was a very expensive individual item, is right up at the top. Even before the gifts were unpacked, there were very high expectations of what they were going to be like in China. Um, the popular press in Tianjin were reporting that the gifts included an elephant the size of a rat, a bird that fed on charcoal, and a pillow that could transport the the, the sleeper to the place of his dreams. Now, obviously, the gifts were the gifts when they arrived were not magical, but they were nevertheless impressive. Um, this is a picture of the planetarium, which was the very expensive, one of the most expensive items. This is a kind of interconnected system. We'll come back to it. Um, these are very fine guns, um, shooting guns. Um, to give you a sense of the sort of quality. These were very, very fine objects. Um, and although ultimately many of these gifts disappeared into the, art, into the basements and the storerooms of the National Pal of the Palace, um, at the time of their presentation, they were displayed to quite a wide audience. The most portable items, that's the books, of, there were some books of prints, um, painted cloths, carpets, saddlery, guns, swords, bolts of wooden cloth and Irish tabernets, and two telescopes were taken to Roha to um, 
uh, to the emperor's summer retreat there for his birthday celebrations. And the emperor seems to have paid his own amount of attention to these gifts because he sent at least the Book of Prince, he sent it back to Beijing to have the names, they sent a Book of Prince of the English nobility. And he sent it back to Beijing to have the names written on. <laughs> okay. So the names were going to be translated into Chinese and then written by, by the Jesuits in Beijing and, and so that he would know who exactly all these English nobles were. Um, meanwhile, the British at their residence in Beijing put on display some of, some of the other objects. And in fact, so many Chinese came to see these, the, the British in their embassy. I mean, I imagine the British themselves were more excited than the gifts, but the gifts were interesting too, that actually they had to put a cap on the number of people who could come in each day. So there were quite a large number of people coming to see them there. And then the most impressive items were set up um, in this hall um, in the Yuan Mingyuan outside Beijing. Um, which was where the emperor kept his collection of European exotica. Um, so, I, and then I had a picture of the Yuan Ming Yuan and the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, um, because it seems to me that these places are kind of parallel. Okay, the, the, the Yuan Ming Yuan is where you put, put European exotica, and Brighton Pavilion is where you put Chinese, where, where Oriental exotica. Um, uh, and they have. So anyway, they have this this exhibition in this hall of all sorts of the, made, the, made, the big gifts are all put on display here and they get quite large numbers of people and the emperor does a formal inspection of them. Now, so everybody can see that the British have presented really magnificent gifts. I mean, uh, the costs of these are really large, okay? This is, this is a lot of money that's being given if you're, if you're in 18th century values. Um, and the emperor, the Qianlong emperor, responded with um, impressive gifts of his own to the English king and also to members of the embassy. This is the gift to the king, okay, not to the members of the embassy with just the numbers. We don't have values of these, they just came out of the storeroom, okay, the, the, the palace. So he, there's some, there was some discussion about what was being included, you know, we have a lot of Korean cloth in store, we can give it to these people, but we don't have the prices. But it does suggest that um, the main Chinese gift was fine textiles. So 945 pieces, unclear how large these pieces are of textiles. Um, there's also in this list a variety of conventional Chinese gift items. Porcelain, jade, fans, incense, lacquerware, and so on. All in, many of them in quite impressive qualities, uh, quantities and also of high quality, and that's why I put up these um, lacquer caskets. Um, uh, and there are also some gifts um, which are clearly the, the direct response to the British gifts. So there's a set of pictures of Chinese battles, clearly a direct response to the fact that the English presented a set of pictures of British battles. Um, uh, the Chinese also give furniture, which I don't think was a very classic Chinese gift in this period. Lanterns, again, there was one of the major British gifts of the Chinese is two huge chandeliers. So the Chinese give lanterns, which looks like a return, and sword blades. Well, the British gave the Chinese sword blades, the Chinese return sword blades. And then finally, there are also gifts that the Qianlong Emperor presented with his own, own hands. And the most important of these is a wooden box um, containing a book of paintings that, of the previous Qing rulers, each with a poetic description in the emperor's calligraphy, and a jade scepter and a set of Han Dynasty jades, um, which uh, we don't think survives, <laughs> sadly, or at least not as a box. Um, although the individual items were beautiful, rare, and costly, it was the scale of the Chinese gifts that was most impressive. One of the things that's very striking is this is there were just so many more gifts than to the other Western, other European embassies that come in the Qing dynasty. So um, in 1678, the Portuguese, an embassy from the Portuguese, was given 91 pieces of silk. Well, that's very different from getting 945, um, which is what's given to the British. Uh, and also, the other thing that was impressive for the British when they got the gifts was the number of occasions on which gifts were given. It was the first huge number of gifts arrived, and then 
as gifts were given again um, for the audience for the emperor's birthday, for a feast at a tour when, the, when McCartney toured the Imperial Gardens as the embassy left Beijing, and again on several occasions as they travelled south, yet more gifts arrived for distribution. Clearly, the gifts both given both by the Chinese and by the British were intended to demonstrate in material form the wealth and power of the two countries and the splendour of their rulers' generosity, while at the same time flattering the recipients. I mean, it's clearly the purpose of these gifts. But all this, at the same time, they also reflect a very real political agenda that's underlying the negotiations. Basically, there's a hard political context for what's going on. It's easy to see all this as um, uh, cultural, uh, uh, cul uh, the, the cu uh, cultures meeting, but actually there's money and power on, underneath it. And the, the, really, the hard political context is the immense value of the trade between Britain and China, plus the rise of British maritime power. So those are the two key <coughs> factors. The aim of the British government in sending this embassy was to reduce the tax that the Qing government extracted from the China trade, which would obviously make it more powerful. Um, the Qing state, on the other hand, had an obvious interest in retaining all the tax it's currently getting from the China trade, and therefore it has an interest, a financial interest in avoiding any change to the existing arrangements. This is particularly important because um, the, uh, a considerable portion of the tax take from the, uh, and particularly the kind of taxes that the British are objecting to in Guangdong, goes to the Emperor's privy purse. Okay? And, is, and there's huge calls on the privy purse at this point of view because of the various wars that, are associated, that we associate with the late Tianlong period, and um, particularly at this, at this moment there are wars going on against the Gurkhas in Tibet. So the Chinese state is funding large-scale wars, they, 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 they don't want to lose, they, they, they're in no position to suddenly accept a reduction in their tax trade on a major um, trading item. On the other hand, British naval power means that it's highly risky for the Qing to do a flat rejection of British demands. So th that's, th that's where the Qing are in between. They're in between British naval power and their own financial needs. Um, and the British want more money out of, uh, I mean, I know less about British finances, but my guess is that they too had reasons why they wish to extract more money from the China trade and not to have it going to the Qing court. Um, and the Qing, I mean, actually the China trade's what's paying for all this. All these gifts on both sides are heavily paid for by the China trade. The other thing that is um, central to the gifts, which is, is, that, is the comparison of Chinese and British military power. So the British gifts include the six cannon and the mortar, a scale model of one of the largest and best armed ships in the British Navy, which was HMS Royal Sovereign, which was later Admiral Collingwood's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar. It's a huge 100-gun ship. Um, guns, pistols, and swords. And it is very clear that these were the gifts that the Chinese were most interested in, particularly the model of HMS Royal Sovereign. Um, when the list of gifts um, presented by the English was translated into Chinese, most of the entries in that list were dr drastically abbreviated. They just cut and cut and cut. Um, the one exception to this was a description of the model of HMS Royal Sovereign, uh, where the entire gist of the English text is maintained when they get to translating that bit. It makes it look like the ship is a much more impressive present than the British had made it look, because it suddenly comes out as a really large item. Um, and the, tra the, the translation appears to have accurately predicted the emperor's interests, because when he went to see the presence at the Yuan Ming Yuan, that sh model of a ship was what he asked questions about. And in fact, he is a, they are extremely concerned about the British naval ship they have off the coast at this point, um, in Zhushan of Zhejiang, uh, which has brought the embassy, and there's constant correspondence going on about, uh, about to keep an eye on what exactly this ship is doing and to make sure that the, nothing 
troublesome happens. And, and the general mentor asks questions about this, technical questions about the ship and its gunnery, which the interpreter is unable to translate, which is why we know about it. Um, the Chinese visitors to the embassy were also um, enthusiastic about these sword blades. This one is apparently in the V&A. Um, uh, it's a sword made by Thomas Gill of Birmingham for the McCartney embassy. Um, and th this is one of the most successful British presents to individual Chinese are these sword blades. Sword blades were a collector's item in China, so it's not entirely unreasonable. But it's quite clear that a large number of Manchu generals, these, these sword blades apparently um, could cut through um, iron without blunting them. Uh, that's what they say. Anyway, they were obviously very fine, very flexible sword blades. And the British also put the cannon on display in their residence. They actually get an opportunity in which they fire the cannon off in front of the emperor. Um, and it's noticeable that the, um, if you're looking for gifts now preserved in the National Palace Museum, the, one, the only ones that I find that seem to be labelled, this is all very preliminary research, um, are these guns. Um, and it's, this gun says, um, one, one gun, present one um, self-firing gun presented in the eighth month of the 58th year of the Qianlong Emperor. So this is someone who wants to know both what this gun does and when it came in. Okay? This is a proper re record of provenance, which the other objects don't get. And it's clearly relevant that it was thought worth remembering this about the gun. And the Qianlong Emperor responded to these displays of British military technology by ordering his officials to put on their own show of military power as the embassy travels south. So they lined up soldiers along all the, as the embassy travels south, they go south along the Grand Canal after the embassy is finished. And the, there were soldiers lined up along both banks of the river all the, or the canals all the way down and firing off their guns. Um, and in fact, one of, the, one of the diarists, one of the people writing about the embassy wrote, so much military honor was paid to the embassy that the salutes could only be compared to a train of wildfire laid from Peking to Canton and continually exploding as we proceeded. Um, now, McCartney and the other senior members of the embassy are pretty dismissive of this Chinese show of force. They say, well, look, they've only got matchlocks, they don't have flintlock, the flintlock guns. They're actually flintlock guns are about to go out themselves, about to be replaced by percussion caps at this moment. I'm developing an interest <laughs> in gun locking mechanisms. Um, but McCartney is impressed by the number of uh, soldiers that the Chinese could muster. And he, on the basis of seeing this huge number of soldiers, he decides that if the British are going to attack China, the best thing would be a coastal raid. Um, because you could disrupt, disrupt their coastal trade very easily, but the internal army would be very difficult to defeat because of the simple numbers of men. And really that brings him back into line with the Qianlong Emperor. Both sides think that that ship is the crucial object, that the British naval power is the big issue. So that's, that's the hard political context of what's going on. Inside that hard political context, gifts are a way of producing relationships between the two sides. Um, because they're things, they're a way of communicating um, in a context where you can't talk very easily because there's only one interpreter and there are 100 people on the embassy. Okay? Well, there's one interpreter and a 13-year-old. Okay? <laughs> and the 13-year-old learnt Chinese on the boat going out, so his Chinese is quite limited. There are also the Jesuits in Beijing, but for various reasons they're not involved in interpreting this embassy. Gifts, so, so gifts, in this context, gifts are a way of, of, of speaking, but what you say with a gift is always ambiguous because it's a thing, it's an object. It doesn't say clearly what it means in the, so that both sides will not necessarily understand it in the same way. And that's important and valuable because um, in diplomacy, one of the things you're aiming for, and I, I have a friend who's a diplomat who's just written a really interesting article about the intersection between diplomatic practice and international relations theory. And one of the things he talks about is the importance of reaching st of the studied imprecision of diplomatic language. 
the need to say things not precisely in order to get an agreement. And that's studied in precision. Uh, so, sorry, that I should give his name. He's, Nigel, he's called Nigel Gould Davies. Um, and it, I think it came out, Journal of, Inter Journal of International Politics and Relations. I forget what the journal, I can tell you. Um, so, using gifts is a way of expressing ideas, but not pinning anyone down to a single meaning. At the same time, gifts create an obligation. I give you a gift, you owe me something. Um, but they also can express subordination. I give you a gift because it's my duty to give you a gift, and you don't owe me anything. That was an expression of my duty. They express, so they can express both my superiority, I give you a gift and you owe me, and my <laughs> subordination, I give you a gift, um, and that expresses my lower position. And in this context, we need to think, I think, separately about two kinds of gifts. Gifts between rulers and gifts to private individuals. If we look at gifts between princes, um, this is an area in which attitude in 18th century Europe were changing rapidly. Um, and that change is articulated around a whole lot of disputes about the word tribute. Okay? Um, so tribute was understood as a gift made as a duty by an inferior ruler to a superior ruler. Um, and roughly speaking, tribute is a word strongly associated with kings and princes, okay? <laughs> Except in the context of something like the tribute of a sigh or sort of romantic poetry. Most of the time we're talking about kings. Um, now, tributes worked quite okay in the context of the hierarchy of rulers in early the 17th and early 18th century Europe. Um, you, you give tributes to rulers above you on that scale, um, even, and they may be entirely symbolic and not express real subordination, but the theoretical subordination is acceptable to people. But in the 18th century, that hierarchy of rulers is being increasingly contested by powers that are low down on the hierarchy um, and uh, high up um, in terms of power, basically Britain and France, which are relatively low um, compared to the papacy and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and the Britain, so Britain and France in this period are pushing towards the idea of presence between rulers as a free gift that should be understood as a symbol of the nation. Okay, that's very different from a gift as tribute. And British expectations of gift giving during the embassy to China reflected these concerns. So Maxine Berg has argued uh, and has written a nice article talking about the gifts given by the McCartney embassy as an attempt to represent British technological superiority. And that's obviously absolutely in line with this kind of new vision of gift giving. Um, it's interesting that the Qing, that the British at the Qing court perceive the Qing demand for tribute as being similar to the same kind of thing they're campaigning against in Europe. So they don't see it as something exclusively Chinese and different, they see it as old-fashioned. And in fact, um, Staunton, McCartney's secretary, wrote um, about tribute. Terms correspondent to these are still applied to the presence passing between the emperor and foreign princes according to the official style of arrogated superiority affected on these occasions by the Chinese court. So that means they, they call it gong, tribute. Uh -huh. Such as the tone that was formerly assumed by the Chancery of the German Empire towards the other European powers. So he's clearly seeing this idea of tribute in that European context. For the Chinese, I don't think that the British distinction between a present and tribute was very important. The, um, the Chinese term gong, I've got tribute, present, gong, and lead. That doesn't mean I think that tribute means gong, okay? <laughs> They're just four words, okay? The Chinese term, the British translate the Chinese term gong as tribute, but it's not an exact match for tribute. Tribute is really closely associated with kings and princes if you look it up in the Oxford. English dictionary for this period, whereas gong is a gift from an inferior to a superior. It doesn't have to be anything to do, lots of people, Chinese provinces give gong, 
or the word for their giving is gone to, to the emperor. They're, and they're not um, kings and princes. What the gong is, is a general statement of the cosmic superiority of the Chinese emperor to everybody. You always present gifts upwards to him. But gong is not a term of particular subject for any particular debate in China. Nobody's particularly interested in it. And indeed, it seems to me that the Chinese are more concerned. I don't know if anyone here has heard Adam Chow talk about his model of hosting. Um, Anne Chow is an anthropologist at Cambridge who's um, working on the idea of the central idea of hosting as a metaphor for sovereignty in Chinese, in, in Chinese culture. And I, it seems to me that that idea of the Chinese being the hosts, and they did insist on paying for everything in the embassy, and it cost far, far more than the gifts. So um, uh, John Barrow. Um, calculated on the figures that one of the Chinese officials gave him, he calculated that the embassy cost the Chinese about £173,000. The total cost of the embassy to the British was about £80,000. And that, that most of that cost was on the ship, on getting a warship, warship from, from England to China and the crew of the ship. The, the presents are like £15,000, but £173,000 is the cost the Chinese are paying to provide food, our service staff to ship, transport porters, the whole business of having the embassy. So, and McCartney keeps offering to pay for that, but the but the but the Chenong's not having that. The Chinese are going to pay for everything to do with the embassy, and I think that is part of that that cultural emphasis on hosting. So it seems to me that hosting was pretty non-negotiable from the Chenong emperor's point of view, even at massive cost. But the terminology for describing the British gifts was something they could be flexible about. In fact, both sides are fairly flexible about it. When, um, when the interpreter first tells McCartney that there's gong is written on the ships that they're bringing to Be Beijing, so this is tribute, and he says this means tribute. They, he translates this word as tribute. McCartney says, well, I just pretended I hadn't seen it, um, basically. Um, it says he, he's, he decided to ignore the matter unless it was forced on his attention. Later, when the items are being put up in the Yuan Ming Yuan, there's a dispute between the craftsmen putting the items up and um, the British craftsmen about how they're going to be handled. And the Chinese craftsmen say, well, these items are gone, so they belong to the Chinese emperor. And the, British, the, the guy who's interpreting for the British leads, the Biao, says, no, um, they're not gone, they're li. Well, li, in this context, is basically another term for a gift. Yeah? Um, and uh, it's a matter of, and the, the lower, the lower level Chinese official, who's not that low, Zhang Rei, who's who's there, um, he he backs up the workers and says, no, you should call them gong, and this belongs to him. But Jin Tian, who's the Korean, who's the president of the board of works, who then turns up, he says, no, Li is fine, and basically that's okay because basically these words don't mean anything very significantly different in Chinese. There isn't a particular reason why gong or li should be more or less acceptable. You might, I mean, they, they do have nuances of different meaning, but this is not something that people are having a fight about. Whereas in English, the term tribute and present means something really significantly different and something the British care about a lot. However, most of the time you don't have to worry about this because the gifts are things. Most of the time they don't have to be labeled. It's only when you're labeling them that this problem emerges. Um, and I think, in a way, the gifts are valuable because, as things, um, it doesn't matter whether or not they're tribute. And they, the two sides can understand them differently. The, 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 the Chinese can understand them as gifts upwards, than, whereas the British can understand them as, as symbols of their own technological and other superiority. I also want to talk a bit about gifts given to individuals, um, because those two are really important in creating relationships. We th it's very easy to think of all the gifts that the embassy sent as being given to the Qianlong Emperor, but they weren't. The, uh, McCartney was given discretion as to how much to give to who. Um, and really quite a large number of those gifts, were, of the gifts that he took, were destined for senior members of the Chinese court. Um, he Shen and other senior officials they're dealing with. Uh, uh, he, he says that he, he says, McCartney before he went decided that the Chinese had refined sentiments of virtue and honor. So it would be in a, inappropriate to try and bribe them. But by what, what he really means by that is he's not going to give them money. He did give them very um, large amounts of, he did give them objects. 
And Chilong Emperor is not at all concerned about this, and he does give them, he gives the British flat money, okay? He gives them silver specie. Um, but he also, Chilong Emperor also gives gifts to individuals. He gives the J. Rui to McCartney, he gives this rather lovely J. Rui to George Leonard Staunton, um, he gives um, purses um, to the interpreter Jacobus Lee. Um, he, on the journey south, he sends a red sheet of paper with this character Fu on it, as a, in his handwriting, as a personal gift to McCartney to persuade him that he himself is really concerned in the success of the British trading demands or canny negotiating move, because he's clearly concerned primarily that they should not succeed. Um, now, both the Chinese and the British are very conscious that these kinds of personal gifts given to win allegiance, which is clearly what's going on, are highly problematic for the state. In England, this is the time of the trial of Warren Hastings. Well, Warren Hastings um, is grew out of the scandals of the East India Company over gifts from Indian rulers, and this trial is dragging on in the courts in London all across the time of the embassy. And indeed, McCartney has been heavily involved in this because his previous position was as governor of Madras. And he was sent to Madras specifically to deal with the corruption crisis in the East India Company caused by Indian rulers giving gifts, whether extorted or whatever, from, um, uh, to British um, officials or merchants. Meanwhile, in China, this is shortly after the Gansu contribution scandal. Uh, you may not have heard of the Gansu, not so famous as the trial of Warren Hastings, um, but the Gansu contribution scandal in the 18, in 1780s ended with the execution of 56 senior officials in Gansu, which is a really significant number, um, and the exile of many, many more. And it's also, this is just before um, the fall of Hersham. And, um, Obviously, Hersham famously, famously venal, um, and his fall for corruption was something that McCartney was told was going to happen while he was in Beijing. So everybody knows. I mean, this is he falls in 17, he's executed 1796, but everyone knows this is about to happen in Beijing. I mean, if McCartney hears it, it's really widespread gossip. Okay, <laughs> his access to the inner gossip of the Qing court is um, not great. So it's a real problem to receive valuable gifts from another ruler while you're on engaged in diplomatic negotiations. And McCartney deals with this by saying that the scepter that he's received, which presumably looked something like this but better because he was, he was the ambassador and Staunton was only his secretary, um, see he's, he writes about it, to me it does not appear to be of any, six, any um, great value. And we'll come back to the value of jade in a minute. Um, Qing officials, on the other hand, have to make decisions about what to accept or not. So Song Yun, who um, is the Qing's sort of border disputes handler of, of the period, um, a, Mongol, a Mongol who escorts Cart McCartney down south to make sure he doesn't cause any trouble, he says, he, he, he writes to the Qianlong Emperor saying he's accepted 20 bottles of English wine or European wine that the British have given him as a gift, but he has explained to them that he couldn't accept another kind of gift um, uh, because the ministers in our dynasty's government should not have private relations with others. So presumably he wouldn't have accepted, presumably giving food, okay, and, or, or, or something that you consume is okay in this context. Um, and also he feels he has to tell the emperor that he accepted these gifts. And, and McCartney confirms that he didn't accept any other gifts, but he took the one. Do we know what gift uh, McCartney got from the emperor? He, McCartney got another scepter, but of higher uh, quality. Yeah, I know, that's one because it's, it's very green, that one. That's yes, exactly. I, but uh, no, I think McCartney's was white. That's what it says. Individual presents were only problematic if the value is relatively low, and the gifts can be exactly reciprocated. So there's one poem where Qilinga, the, the, the governor of Jiangxi, visits the embassy on the way down, and he gave McCartney tea, teacups, and silk. And McCartney gave him two pearl watches, hardware, knives, scissors, and brandy. Okay, and this is a fairly equal exchange, which clearly nobody is particularly concerned about. But basically, so we've got two kinds of gifts. We've got gifts between princes and gifts between individuals, which function differently, but both work to create relationships and to define those relationships. 
And the aim of giving the gifts is to win the negotiations. And obviously, success in the negotiations then depends to some extent, not entirely, because obviously there's a hard political context, on whether the gifts are accepted and whether they're valued by the recipients. And the big disaster on this front is that carriages, which if you remember back, were the really expensive. They had these two very fine yellow carriages made in London for the Qianlong Emperor. It's a complete catastrophe in, in English, 18th century English carriages. This is like the Queen State coach things. Okay, and in English carriages, the, the coachman sits above the passenger. This was totally unacceptable in China. So there was, there was there were, I mean, Qing officials travelled in them. They said they were very comfortable. They actually used, they didn't not in these. They took a third carriage for the ambassador. And then that third carriage, when they left, they thought, well, we'll give it to Hershen. I mean, Hershen, famously venal, took everything, refused the carriage. Okay, <laughs> a completely useless item in China where your coachman sat above you, however comfortable. Um, and it ends up, McCartney actually takes it back to um, Guangzhou where it's shipped to India. Um, so it's almost, it's one of the most expensive, these are very, very expensive gifts and as complete failure. And just to think about it, you know, what is it that makes some gifts more successful than others? And it seems to me that the, the most successful gifts are the ones that have a clear monetary value in global trade. It's not clear whether it's okay to give silver cash all the time, silver money, silver specie all the time, but gifts that have a clear monetary value and the man, a monetary value that can be equally accepted by both sides. And some of these things are the conventional diplomatic gifts of the 18th century. Guns, jewels, precious metals. You know, if you give a, a gold box a set with diamonds, a very large and expensive diamonds, everybody can see in both sides the, what its value is. Uh, silk and tea on the Chinese side, these are very classic diplomatic gifts and uh, attitudes that are relevant. And in fact, on the British side, um, these are really the items that McCartney um, inherited from the Cathcart embassy. There was an embassy to China before McCartney that failed because Colonel Cathcart, who was the ambassador, died on the way. Okay, so the embassy was aborted because the ambassador had died. Uh, he got, they got as far as Indonesia, or what's now Indonesia. Um, and and then their gifts came back to London where they'd given to McCartney who took them with him. And he, Cathcart had taken much more conventional gifts, um, gold box with diamond, something called mathematical and philosophical instruments. But if you look at them, 10 telescopes, 18 thermometers, 24 pairs of silver opera glasses, 30 pairs of silver spectacles, four microscopes. These are relatively small items, okay, that come in sets. Then guns, watches, theodolites, cutlery, and pocket, Morocco gold mounted pocket books. Um, so these are quite conventional gifts. They're less expensive than what McCartney took. McCartney had was hugely pretentious, much more pretentious than, <laughs> you know, he was really de de determined to have, have a magnificent em em embassy to China. And he wangled more out of the East India Company than Colonel Cathcart had managed. Um, and he added as well, uh, other more expensive gifts. On the Chinese side, conventional diplomatic gifts, clearly silk and tea, which are given to most embassies. Um, but there's also this big trade between China and Britain, which means that each side knows what the other values most. The Chinese export to Britain silk, cotton cloth, nankeens, um, tea, porcelain, lacquer, and fans at this time. Um, and when, the, when they give these things to the British, the British can see their value. They, they perceive uh, the value of these objects. Um, the British export to China high quality woolen textiles and clockwork seem to be um, major items. Well, high quality woolen textiles is a big thing that the British export. And indeed, the British see the high quality, their textiles um, uh, for sale across China as they travel. They're interested in noting this. And George Staunton, in his account of the embassy, says specifically that the presents were chosen on the basis of what was known to be in greatest demand in Guangzhou. So they took things that they knew that the Chinese normally bought. Um, and woolen cloth was the most successful present. Um, uh, uh, the Qianlong Emperor actually gives some of this woolen cloth onto his generals. And there are letters from him saying that he is presenting them with, you know, fine pieces of English kerzimiers to or Irish tabernets to make a jacket with. Um, and, and then there were thank you letters from them to him in the Qing archives 
and indeed one letter saying, why did you not thank me <laughs> for the very fine English BT, they call it BT, uh, uh, the English cloth that they're, they're being sent. Um, so, and those, so clearly, if, if he gives them on to his senior officials, these are top people in the provinces, these are an acceptable present to him. Items that are unfamiliar and have no recognised value are much less successful as gifts. And the most striking example of this is jade. Um, the British were not familiar with jade and defined it as agate, which was a stone they considered not to be of much value. And so when McCartney explains the gift of a jade rui to George III, he explains it as entirely as something symbolic, um, as a symbol of, and he says it's emblematic of prosperity and peace, and that's pretty much all he says about it. Um, antique jades, which were even more valuable to the Chinese, are even less acceptable, in, interesting to the British. Um, so when the emperor presents this wooden curio box, which has 10 pieces of Han Dynasty jade and a rui, Mark McCartney described it as a little box of old Japan with some pieces of agate and other stones in it. Um, in the same vein, John Barrow suggested that um, future embassies ought to take Derbyshire Spa, and I didn't know what Derbyshire Spa was when I, so this is just a piece of Derbyshire Spa, um, Blue John, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, to show you an 18th century piece from Chatsworth, in fact to show you roughly what it looks like. He thought it, if, if the Chinese liked jade, they'd like Derbyshire Spa. And actually, apparently today, the Chinese make something very, do craft work in something very equivalent, which you can mine near Zhejiang. So he was right that this was the kind of object the Chinese might have liked. <laughs> but clearly, it wasn't jade. Um, and it appears that the Chinese became aware of this English attitude towards jade. Because if you looked at the lists of the gifts they gave, the first set of gifts includes jade. A number of pieces of jade, but the second, third, fourth, and fifth sets of gifts to the English king include no jade. So it, it appears that they, they, they took on board that the English couldn't see this as a valuable item. But even when the monetary value of gift objects was appreciated by both sides, their value as gifts was complicated by the fact that both sides regarded the items of their international trade as exotic luxuries. These are not essential items, they're exotic luxuries. And that plays into the logic of gift giving by which each side wants to play up their own generosity and play down their, their debt, their obli how obligated they are to the giver. Um, and the obvious, well, the best example of this is clearly the mathematical and philosophical instruments. That's what they were called by the British when they purchased them. Um, what um, uh, Cranmer in his article called scientific instruments, um, what the Chenlong Emperor call, called objects strange and ingenious, <laughs> and George Leonard Staunton called toys <laughs> and gaudy trifles, or oh, extraordinary pieces of ingenious and complicated mechanism set in frames of precious metal studded with jewels and producing by means of internal springs and wheels movements apparently spontaneous. Um, so this is actually describing what are the spectacular automata of London craftsmen that the Chinese have been buying from the British at this point. Croc it, oh, uh, have I got pictures of these? Yes, so these, I mean, automata, so these, you know, things where the clock, the clock goes and the bird um, nods its head. These, has anyone ever been to the Bose Museum? Um, the Bose Museum has a rather wonderful silver swan, which apparently was originally going to be exported to China, but somebody, the James Cox went bankrupt. I, there's a long, long complication. So anyway, th it's this kind of object, which it's a silver swan that um, lowers its beak and pecks up some silver fish in the water, which when I saw it when I was about 12, I thought was just the most wonderful thing ever. <laughs> anyway, the Chinese were buying a lot of this kind of toys, really, um, from the British at this period. Uh, these are 18th century ones in the National Palace, New British made, Autom automata and clocks and scientific instruments in the National Palace Museum, not ones that came with the embassy, just other ones. Um, Lord McCartney also purchased a Herschel reflector telescope. Um, that's this object. Well, it's probably not this object. This object appears to be, so this is a reflecting, a, a telescope that uses reflection rather than just lenses. Um, and. This object appears to be a Herschel reflector telescope not given by the McCartney mission that was also in Chen Long's collection. 
And McCartney actually bought his Herschel reflector telescope in Macau. He didn't buy it in England. And you know, the reason it was in Macau was because this was an incredibly suitable thing to give to the Chinese emperor. You know, high Qing officials bought these items for the purposes, I mean, there aren't very many in collections outside the imperial collection in China. It appears that they went, at this period, very heavily. They were used for, as gifts to the emperor. Um, so these kind of items are reaching China in significantly large numbers. And these are some, just some other British-made telescopes in, in the collection. Um, uh, so the, the, the Chinese are collecting. All, and when, when McCartney is taken on a tour of the gardens in Roha, they realize what an immense collection the Tianlong Emperor has of this kind of stuff. And after that, they don't want to give the scientific instruments that they bought. And they actually hold a lot of them back, and they don't give them, because they, they think that he's already got better ones, finer ones. He's got all the most up-to-date stuff, but he's also got stuff covered with jewels. And indeed, similar stuff is being made in Guangzhou. This is a made in Guangzhou, Western-style clock of this period, which was also in the National Palace Museum. Um, so, in fact, they take um, a lot of these scientific instruments back to Guangzhou, um, where some of them are sold, um, and quite a lot of them, all the things like that, where they took a, model ste a little model steam engine and all this stuff, is given to one of the members of the embassy, a mechanic, <coughs> who had a very high opinion of himself, called James Dinwiddie, who'd come as a kind of scientific demonstrator. And he takes them to India, where he makes his fortune as a scientific demonstrator with them. Um, but they're then never actually opened and presented to the Qianlong Emperor. And actually, the British see um, many of the Chinese gifts in the similar light as exotic luxuries. Um, and um, John Ayres just told me this, this afternoon, sitting here, that many of them ended up in the Brighton Pavilion as um, ornamental exotica. Others ended up in um, the palace, the, the, the house lived in by the queen and her children decorated by her at um, Frogmore at Windsor Palace. And you hear, see here a, a um, lacquer um, cabinet, which can be plausibly identified as one that came from the Chinese embassy. And indeed, someone called Joseph Farringdon, who's a diarist, visited Frogmore at this time and comments on the existence of these gifts from the Emperor of China in the Queen's private rooms. Again, we're talking about items that are seen as toys, really, um, not, not serious necessities, decorative items, in this case appropriate for women and children. The other type of gift that fails are those that are intended to convey messages about ideology and norms. And these are the gifts most highly valued by the givers. Um, and at one level, you can see this as inevitable because the, um, the, the norms are incompatible. If you're trying to explain ideology through gifts and the two sides' ideologies are totally incompatible, you're going to have a difficult time presenting your gifts. Um, but also, these kind of gifts need extensive verbal interpretation. You need to explain these items. And that's difficult because they've got very limited interpreting. But also, it's difficult because the, the kind of genres in which you're supposed to speak on a diplomatic mission doesn't give you all right on a diplomatic vision, doesn't give you a lot of chance. And the most obvious problem with it, the, for the British point of view, the most obvious case is the planetarium. Um, this, this object, um, it was a combined clock, globe, and orrery. It's designed to represent the universe. It was built by a German pastor and then um, redecorated in London for its presentation. It actually was kind of second-hand, not surprisingly. It was the most costly single item that the embassy took. Um, and the embassy gave a lengthy explanation of it. You're not supposed to read all this. The point is, this is what it said in English, and this is how much was left once it got translated into Chinese, OK? Um, and the other point is that what gets cut out is technical stuff about the planet Saturn and the um, moons of Jupiter. Well, that wasn't because the Jesuits couldn't translate that stuff. This, um, the Jesuits in Beijing were perfectly capable of translating astronomical 
stuff. They, they, you know, they'd done a lot of it. They had all the terminology. It seems to me it's much more because this doesn't fit into, a, um, into the genre of writing a gift list. Because they also cut out a lot at the bottom here about this will be a monument to the respect in which the virtues of his imperial man majesty, the general emperor, are held in the remotest parts of the world. They cut the flattery as well. They want something shorter because a Chinese gift list just does not include this kind of stuff. A gift list is a particular kind of genre. Um, and it's notable that when the Qianlong Emperor um, presents, he presents a gift which also doesn't get to understand. This is his curio box. And he tries a speech to make his gift, to explain his gift. And he, he's got the curio box with pictures of the Qing Emperors, inscriptions in his own hands, Han Dynasty Jades and Rui. And all the English sources agreed that the Emperor put a high value on this gift. But that's really all they can agree on. This is the version of his speech given by um, Anderson, who was McCartney's valet, who says that he asked the interpreter what the emperor said. But if you look at, uh, um, we're running, we've run out of time, so I shan't, shan't te tell it to you. But it's quite clear if you look at if what you then McCartney says to Henry Dundas in the British government, he, he, he calls it uh, a box as a token of friendship containing a little book with slight drawings and a few Chinese verses. Um, considered, together with several, as he considered them, rare and curious productions of different kinds of stones. Um, and Staunton says, well, the whole point of this gift is that it shows that the emperor can write poetry and that he runs his country so beautifully that, there's, um, that he has leisure to write poetry. Um, basically, the, whatever the meaning of this gift that the Qianlong emperor was trying to convey did not get back to the British. Uh -huh. Basically, cultural differences and problems of translation means that both sides were unable to effectively explain the meaning of the gifts intended to present their philosophies and world views. And all, they, all the, pe the people who received the planetarium and the curio box could understand was that the other side valued these things. They, they couldn't really get why. This wasn't because the Jesuits couldn't translate it. Clearly, they could have translated it. But it's about what the kinds of things you can talk about and the kind of genres of writing in a diplomatic um, mission. So finally, I want to say that the McCartney Embassy um, was, a was an occasion on, these are just random gifts, on which both sides were engaged in diplomacy over real economic issues. But there was limited mutual knowledge, no shared language, and only very limited shared cultural expectations for diplomacy. And gifts, um, in that context, gifts were a very important part of a kind of diplomatic toolkit. Um, and that explains their cost and splendor. And they were, um, they could co they were valuable because they could combine a sort of sense of mutually agreed value with the possibility of ambiguous meaning. And that meant that they could be used to shape the presentation of the relationship in ways that would be acceptable to both sides. And in that context, silk or a jewel in crusted box were more effective than jade or a planetarium uh -huh, because of the va their value on global markets. Of course, this doesn't succeed. I mean, the, Ch the Channel Emperor wins in terms of the McCartney Embassy. He gets everything through the British. He, he denies all their requests and doesn't get attacked. So, I mean, in terms of what happens at that point, the, 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 uh, the embassy is a success from their point of view. And it's very striking to contrast that with similar um, negotiations in India at the same time, where Indian rulers give on trade and end up with British colonisation, you know, af after time. Uh, but that can never overcome the actual sort of hard political context, which is that you've still got this huge trade, you've got the British with their demands, and you've got British military power. And so in the end, what happens is that, given that they didn't arrange an agreement at this point, given that the diplomacy was won entirely by one side, the British go over into smuggling and you get the opium war. But that doesn't mean that the gifts weren't, didn't function in the diplomacy as it worked. Okay, thank you. Sorry to overrun that.